Welcome to Shanghai, the top choice for global investment. A century ago, the booming Bund secured Shanghai's place as the financial center of the Far East. For the last 30 years, the Liu Jiazui Finance and Trade Zone has risen to prominence, setting a new standard for China. Now, Shanghai's development is getting set to usher in a new era, and this time, the world's eyes will be drawn to the North Bund, a world-class investment destination. Welcome to the North Bund. Shanghai's most sought-after investment zones line the Huangpu River. The North Bund forms the top of Shanghai's Golden Triangle with Lu Jiazui and the Bund. The area has long been a hub for the global shipping industry and has welcomed an influx of financial and technology companies. It's the choice for global and regional headquarters because of its central strategic location. Now, the North Bund is further evolving to provide thriving investment opportunities. The four square kilometer North Bund is the largest redevelopment zone in the core area of downtown Shanghai. The area is divided into three zones. About 8.4 million square meters of new construction space have been planned and it is regarded as central Shanghai's biggest and most iconic project since the development of Liu Jiazui. Throughout 2020 and 2021, more than 10 plots of land will be opened up for commercial development surrounding the 60,000 square meters of central parkland at the heart of the North Bund. The entire area will feature more than 200 high-end office buildings, providing global enterprises with fine office space. Premium spaces dedicated to conventions and events, and a grand theater with a seating capacity of over 2,000. The heart of the North Bund will be filled with high-density office buildings and commercial facilities. As part of the grand design, a 480-meter skyscraper will become the tallest building on the west bank of the Huangpu River, with another two landmark buildings rising as tall as 380 and 320 meters. It will mirror Liu Jiazui and reinvent the city skyline. The North Bund will be flanked by regions around the Tilan Chiao area and the Hongkou port where historical and culturally important sites will be fully preserved. And it is easily accessible from anywhere in Shanghai. The North Bund will be built into a high-grade commercial district and culturally diverse neighborhoods. The redevelopment of the North Bund will create a new miracle. The North Bund was home to the city's original harbors once Shanghai opened to international trade in 1843, and its Jewish settlement once offered wartime sanctuary to some 20,000 Jewish refugees. Today, the North Bund is more connected to the world than ever before. On the two and a half kilometer stretch of riverfront, the whole shipping industry is represented. These businesses will be the economic engine of the North Bund and the core of Shanghai's international shipping center. In 2020, Shanghai ranked as the world's third largest global financial center. Financial businesses in the North Bund are positioned to Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon to all domestic guests and good morning to our guests overseas. Welcome to our fifth webinar, Interpreting New Foreign Investment Law and Chinese Foreign John Winter Model. I'm May, the moderator of today's event. I'm from Savings Pro Advisory. 
CPS Pro Advisory provide full China entry solutions. This is the central district of Shanghai, Hong Kong district. We are live from the Rafa city in the northbound and facing a great view of Lu Jiazui district and the bound. Our Drive Global Investment Share Hong Kong's Future webinar series are aimed at helping global investors gain a comprehensive understanding of China's further opening up policy and the investment environment of Hong Kong district. The foreign investment law came into effect on January 1, 2020, with the law to foreign invested enterprise being abolished at the same time. Our guest speaker will help you better understand the new law and as well as present how Chinese foreign joint venture model adapts to the business environment under the new law. Please allow me to introduce the first speaker, Huang Feng. Mr. Huang is the chairman of Shanghai Foreign Investment Association. He will introduce the legal framework for foreign investment in China. Good afternoon, morning, and evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen, depending on which time zone you are. So I'm very happy to uh, present the uh, foreign investment law. Uh, so uh, just give you uh, uh, some brief introduction of myself. Uh, so I'm the chairman of the Shanghai Foreign Investment Association. And before that, you know, I work for government for uh, more than 20 years, uh, so five years in uh, Minister of Commerce. Uh, I'm the Deputy Director General of the uh, Foreign Investment Administration Department of MOFCOM. And before that, uh, I work for Shanghai government, uh, specifically uh, first the Shanghai Foreign Investment Commission, then the Shanghai Commission of Commerce. Uh, I, uh, most of my career, I just, you know, I'm responsible for the uh, foreign investment. Uh, approval and also for the promotion of the foreign investment. So uh, the, today the topic will be on uh, foreign investment uh, law, uh, but I will not, you know, give you a very how to say mm, detailed things. Yeah, because most of this will go to uh, your lawyers. Uh, so uh, instead, I will just to give you a. Uh, introduction and introduction of the legal framework uh, of foreign investment in China. I think this is much more important. Yeah. So, uh, uh, the foreign investment legal framework uh, in China uh, now, you know, we have the uh, foreign investment law, uh, which take effect on January this year. So we call it the basic law of foreign investment in China. So previously, we have three foreign invested enterprise law. Uh, that's the uh, basic, uh, the, uh, these are the basic you know, laws you know, of foreign investment you know, before 2020. So once we change the basic law, the foreign investment, we have the new foreign investment law. Actually, we have you know, changed the whole legal framework. So that's why I would like to you know, uh, focus on the foreign investment legal framework. Yeah, so you can have a big picture on foreign investment in, uh, in China. So uh, besides the foreign investment law, which you know uh, took effect in the, on the first day of this year, so actually we also have revised the law of the People's Republic of China on the protection of the investment of Taiwan uh, competitors. Yeah, and at the same time, uh, in our new foreign investment law, so. Uh, it has stated that the organization form, the organization activity guidance yeah, of foreign invested enterprise shall be governed by the company law and also the partnership enterprise law of People's Republic of China. So basically, you know, these four laws, uh, they are on the top of the foreign investment legal framework. So below that, 
uh, the state council also, you know, issue the administrative regulation uh, for the implementation of the foreign investment law. Yeah. So and also under that, yeah, we have departmental rules. For example, uh, we have special administrative measures, or in other words, negative list for foreign investment access. Uh, this is issued by the uh, NDRC and MOF come together. Uh, this year we have the new version, we have the new edition of uh, 20, uh, 2020. And also we have another negative list. Uh, it's the negative, negative list uh, for foreign investment in pilot free trade zones. Yeah, so in free trade zone actually uh, more industries, uh, more fields are open to foreign investors. So we have another negative uh, list. And also we have the catalog of encouraged industry for foreign investment. Yeah, because you know, if you want to uh, invest in China, uh, on the one hand, maybe you face some you know, restrictions. And on the other side, you also will enjoy some you know, uh, uh, incentives. Uh, so uh, the catalog of encouraged industries for foreign investment uh, just states all the industries and fields that Chinese government uh, would like to promote foreign investment. And if you invest in these fields, you can enjoy the incentives. And also we have the foreign investment information reporting measures. Uh, this is also issued by the Minister of, of Commerce. Yeah, so previously we have the you know, approval procedures you know, for foreign investment. So that means if you want to you know, uh, uh, establish or if you want to you know, uh, exit the uh, Chinese market, then you need to get approval. Uh, what we call is a case-by-case -case approval procedure. So uh, once you want to establish or you want to expand, yeah, you need to get approval from the government. So according to the new foreign investment law, uh, foreign investors, they are no longer required to get the approval, but instead they need to report uh, their investment behaviors. So we have this foreign investment information reporting measures. And lastly, uh, uh, there's also a new uh, departmental rules which was issued, you know, actually just you know around one month ago. So it's the measures on handling complaints from foreign invested enterprise. So basically, this is the measure for foreign uh, investment protection. Yeah. So it specializes uh, specifies uh, the channel uh, once the foreign investors they have you know face some you know uh, problems you know from the government, then they can, you know, use this, you know, uh, complaint service just to report to the government, to uh, ask for the government's help to coordinate, uh, uh, to solve their problems, you know, in China. And also uh, in the local level, which means the uh, city or provincial level, actually we also have, you know, regulations on foreign investment. For example, uh, Shanghai, you know, takes the lead, you know. Uh, actually, uh, the foreign investment, uh, the, uh, the regulation on foreign investment in Shanghai uh, was just released, you know, on September 25th by the Standing Committee of the Shanghai Municipality. Yeah, so the regulation will come into force on November 1st, 2020. So actually, this is the first uh, local regulation on foreign investment. Yeah, so that also means, you know, Shanghai uh, takes the lead uh, to promote and also to protect foreign investment uh, to just, you know, make a very sound business environment. Uh, Shanghai is also very, you know, uh, is always, you know, take the leads, you know, in this field in, in China. So basically, you know, this new regulation consists of six chapters, including general provisions expanding, opening up, investment promotion, investment protection, investment management and service with a total of, you know, 51 articles. And then I just would like to, you know, elaborate, you know, more on the uh, departmental rules. Uh, first will be the special administrative measures uh, 
uh, or in other words, negative list for foreign investment access. So uh, actually, we this is the third version of the uh, negative list. Yeah. So uh, each year uh, since 2018, you know, each year Chinese government just issue a revised version of you know a negative list. So of course, you can see uh, the uh, items you know uh, in the you know, uh, in each uh, edition actually has been reduced. So uh, you can see, uh, for example, in 2018 edition, you have 45, you know, uh, items. But next, in 2019, you have 40,000. And this year's edition actually has only uh, 33 uh, items. And on the other hand, yeah, we also have the uh, pilot free trade zone, you know, negative list. So actually, you know, this negative list, you know, actually uh, came, you know, quite early in 2014 because the uh, negative list approach uh, was first adopted, you know, in the uh, pilot free trade zone. So you can see in 2014, there are, you know, uh, 139 items, but you know, if you look at this year's, you know, edition, it's only, you know, 30 items. Yeah, so a very dramatic, you know, reduction of the uh, negative, the items of the negative list, which also means, you know, uh, China gradually, you know, open its, you know, uh, market access, you know, to foreign uh, companies. So, and uh, just to mention the uh, new addition of the negative list, actually, basically, there are three main changes. For example, the first is to uh, opening up the key area. Uh, so, uh, uh, so as you know, Chinese government has promised, so this year, uh, Chinese government has abolished all the restrictions uh, in the financial sector. So if for foreign investors, if you want to invest in the financial area in China, now you can enjoy the national treatment, which means there's no special, you know, measures, uh, no special, like, you know, shareholding uh, requirement, you know, for foreign investors. And also another field is infrastructure. So there's also some, you know, opening measures like, you know, urban water supply and uh, drainage pi uh, pipelines, yeah. So uh, we have, you know, uh, Loose, uh, we have, you know, uh, uh, canceled the restriction, you know, uh, for foreign investment in that area. And the second point is the uh, further easing of the access in, you know, manufacturing and also agriculture. Yeah, for example, you can see uh, the, uh, the restriction, you know, on foreign shares in commercial vehicle manufacturing. Yeah, because according to our, you know, timetable, you know, for commercial uh, vehicle manufacturers, uh, uh, this field was, you know, 100%, you know, open to foreign investment, which means there's no restrictions. Uh, because previously, if you want to, you know, invest in the automobile industry, then uh, you will face, I mean, for the foreign investors, you will face uh, the shareholding, you know, requirement, which means, you know, for the foreign investors, you cannot exceed 50%. But now you can see for commercial vehicle manufacturers, just like the, uh, the, 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 the truck, uh, the, uh, the coach, uh, if you want to invest in manufacturing of these you know, products, uh, then you can set up your wholly owned company. And according to the timetable, uh, in the, within the next two years, uh, which means in 2022, uh, finally, you know, Chinese government will open the, uh, will cancel the restriction, you know, on foreign investment in passenger uh, vehicle manufacturing. manufacturing. So uh, in 2022, uh, there will be no restriction for foreign investment in automobile industry. Yeah, there are also some, you know, change, you know, in the uh, agriculture, yeah, which you can, uh, see from the PPT. And uh, on the you know, basis of the national version of the negative list, uh, we can also see you know, more opening up 
you know, in the free trade zone. So like, you know, uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, yeah, the prohibition of foreign investment in China, in China, in Chinese herbal pieces has been abolished. And also in the education uh, field, uh, wholly foreign owned enterprise are now allowed to set up vocational education institutions. So uh, these are the items of the negative list. Uh, I will not, you know, uh, elaborate in detail. Yeah, so just totally now we have 33 uh, items. Yeah, and Chinese government also uh, have announced that in the coming years we will uh, continue to uh, shorten the list. And the second thing is about the uh, catalog of in, uh, encouraged industry for foreign investment. Uh, it's last year's edition, so hopefully we'll also have a new edition this year. So uh, basically, you know, this uh, catalog uh, uh, has two parts. One is the national catalog, uh, which is uh, applicable throughout the entire country. So there are uh, totally 415 entries. So actually, uh, more articles has been added. Yeah. So if foreign investors, if you, uh, if your foreign investment uh, falls into these fields, that means you can. Uh, that means you have you are investing in the industry that Chinese government encouraged, and accordingly you can. Uh, enjoy some, you know, uh, benefits, which I will mention later. And also we have a central and western area catalog. Yeah, so this is only for the central and western part of China, yeah, because, you know, uh, they lag behind the uh, coastal area. So Chinese government just will give, you know, more uh, incentives for foreign investment there. So totally there are uh, 693 entries included uh, in this uh, catalog. So basically, you know, these are the benefits, uh, uh, three main benefits. First, uh, uh, first is the exemption from the custom duty uh, for imported self-use equipment uh, within the total investment. And second is related to the land supply. So if you invested in the uh, encouraged field, then if you want to have, you know, apply for some land from the government, uh, you can have the uh, lowest uh, land price, uh, which is, you know, uh, actually no less than, you know, 70% of the lowest price standard for industrial land transfer. And last one is for uh, central and western area. So if your investment, if you invest, you know, there in the central and western area, uh, so uh, you can, you know, enjoy the preferential corporate income tax rate of 50% uh, if you fall into the uh, catalog, you know, of the central and western area. Uh, next, uh, I will introduce the foreign investment information reporting. As I have mentioned previously, you know, if you want to invest in China, the, all the foreign investment, actually, they need to get approval from the government. It's a case-by-case, -case, you know, approval procedure, which is, you know, uh, to take the uh, investors quite, you know, some time to get approval. So now China has, you know, uh, changed that. Uh, so instead of, you know, getting approval, so the uh, foreign investors, they just need to, you know, uh, do the uh, foreign investment information filing or reporting. Yeah, so basically there are uh, four kinds of, you know, report. Uh, the initial report, which means if you want to start your business, if, if you want to uh, establish an entity, then you need to submit the initial report. And then if you want to have some change of the uh, conditions of your investment, you also need to get the amendment report. And finally, if you want to just, just exit the market, then you need to do the uh, cancellation report. And finally, there's also an annual report. Yeah. Previously, we have the annual the, the, the review. Now it's the annual report. Yeah. So basically, uh, for foreign investors, uh, if you want to invest in China now, although you don't need the uh, approval, but don't forget to do the report uh, at each stage and each year. 
so uh, basically, you know, uh, these are the uh, requirements you need for the uh, information reporting. Yeah, so they need to submit the basic information of the enterprise, uh, like the name of the investors uh, and the information of the operation, their asset and liability, and especially the uh, actual controller uh, of the foreign investment. So uh, these are the informations that the foreign investors or the foreign investing enterprise are required to submit. So these are the reporting channel. Yeah, so you can do it, you know, by the uh, system. We have the website. We have the online uh, system. So, uh, and these are the scope of the of the uh, of the uh, information reporting. So, what kind of you know companies are required to do the uh, information reporting or filing? Yeah, basically, they are companies direct invested and established by foreign investors, partnership. Uh, foreign companies, if they don't have a legal entity in China, but they have you know, production and business activities in China, they, also, they are also required to do the uh, reporting. And also branches uh, established by foreign enterprise. And finally, the companies established in China by uh, the holding company, the venture capital enterprise, uh, the foreign investment partnerships, yeah, whose main business is investment. And what is the legal responsibility of information reporting? So if foreign investors, if they fail to do the uh, information reporting, uh, they, then they have the legal liability. Yeah, so uh, basically, you know, they will be required by the government, you know, just to uh, make corrections, uh, or even if they uh, do not respond to the requirement from the government, yeah, then maybe they will get, a, you know, uh, they will be fined uh, by the government. Uh, the amount is, you know, more than you know, one hundred thousand RMB and less than five hundred thousand RMB. Uh, next, I just want to also give you. Uh, some introduction on the uh, uh, complaint service, you know, from uh, Chinese government. Yeah. According to the new foreign investment law, uh, China will enhance the uh, investment protection. Yeah, so uh, specifically, they just set up a complaint center at the different government level just to, uh, to, to, to uh, receive complaints from the uh, for investors and help them to solve their solve the problems uh, uh, with the uh, government. Yeah. So so uh, according to the law, so the uh, central government in Ministry of Commerce, yeah, they will send the national uh, complaint center, and also at the province and the uh, uh, the, the, the city level, uh, they are also required to set the complaint center. And in Shanghai, actually, the Shanghai Foreign Investment Con uh, Association, uh, we also, you know, work with, you know, Shanghai Commission of Commerce, yeah, just to, uh, to handle the uh, complaints, you know, from, from the foreign investors and the foreign investment enterprise here. I will not, you know, go very detailed, you know, on these uh, regulations, uh, these rules. Yeah, but just you, just let you, you know, bear in mind if you have, you know, uh, some problems with the government in foreign investment. Yeah, of course, you you have the right just to do the uh, administrative review, and also you can do the uh, administrative lawsuits. But uh, besides that, actually, you also have a channel. Uh, that's the uh, complaint uh, service, you know, uh, at the different level of, you know, uh, uh, Chinese government. In Shanghai, you have the Shanghai level and also the district level. Uh, actually, the last point.
point I just want to touch is that I think uh, to uh, foreign investors and also foreign invested enterprise, I think the uh, the most urgent thing yeah, for, for, for you, uh, actually, it's the uh, five-year transitional period. Yeah. Because according to the foreign investment law, uh, previously, the organizational structure, the organization activity, actually, they are subject to the uh, three uh, foreign invested enterprise law, uh, which uh, uh, will not be uh, effective you know, since, you know, uh, the beginning of this year. So uh, according to the new law, uh, the, the new law actually set up, you know, a five-year uh, trans, uh, transitional period for uh, foreign invested enterprise uh, just to change their uh, articles of association uh, and also the, uh, the, the, the agreement, you know, between, you know, shareholders, yeah, because the uh, now, you know, the, uh, the organizational structure and also the organization uh, activity, they are subject to the company law and the partnership law. Yeah, so for uh, each and every company, actually, you have five years. Uh, uh, I think for the, uh, the wholly owned company, actually, it's quite, you know, it's relatively simple. But for the joint ventures, especially the CJV, uh, the cooperative uh, joint ventures, uh, you need to, you know, negotiate with your partners uh, to, 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 to make, you know, revisions, make changes uh, to make sure that you uh, will be compliant. Yeah. So uh, I think this is the issue that each company they will face. Yeah. So maybe uh, this is the first year you still have, you know, some time, but maybe in the second year and third year, I think this is the uh, issue that you should take very seriously, yeah. Because, you know, uh, there's also some, you know, uh, legal liabilities, uh, like, you know, since uh, January 2025, uh, for those existing foreign invested enterprise that have not transformed their business form or organizational structure in accordance with the law and have not filed for modification re uh, registrations then the department in charge of market supervision and administration shall not accept their application for other registration matters and shall publicize uh, uh, the relevant situation thereof. Yeah, so if you have not finished this thing, you know, by the end of, you know, 2024, then uh, your company will face, you know, uh, some problems. So I think basically, you know, these are the points that I want to touch. And totally, I think uh, they can help you just to set up the uh, framework, or, uh, the legal framework of foreign investment in China. Thank you. Thanks for Mr. Huang's interpretation. Next, Alan McChouse, the commercial strategy and research partner of Deloitte China, will present China's foreign joint venture model sharing under the new foreign investment law. Thank you. So let me, um, let, before we get too far into this, let me uh, quickly, uh, quickly introduce myself. So I've been in China for the past 16 years, and I run a pre-deal consultancy at Deloitte and specifically specialize in joint venture formation. And as we go through the material, I will talk a bit about it from a practitioner best practice point of view and a, a little bit from the academic side as well in terms of um, where the research is, uh, is taking us and showing us where we're at. Um, there are two, two sides to the new joint venture law. One relates to the legacy issue, as just mentioned. 
uh, and the, the transition period to change the, the legacy joint venture um, under the new law, and then there's the going forward best practice approach. I'll focus more on the latter, the best practice going forward, but I'm happy to uh, unpack a little bit around some of the changes. So let me, um, and I'm also going to put a, a very COVID-19 angle to it, because that's, I think, likely going to drive some of the decisions that a lot of the companies on this call are, are probably facing. So very specifically in terms of what I plan to walk through, uh, market trends post-COVID-19, uh, a little bit around the experience and what we're seeing with international joint ventures and specifically uh, China, uh, Sino foreign joint ventures. Um, and then finally, uh, I'll touch on some, some best practice that we've, uh, we've observed in, in the market. So moving through, let's, uh, let's talk about where we are in the, in the business cycle. So with, uh, with joint ventures, uh, they tend to go through a, a cycle where they peak and trough. So in the, in the current situation, we're, um, we're expecting with the COVID-19 implications and, and the general slowing of the global economy that over the next 12 to 18 months uh, that we will see a significant increase in the number of joint ventures and specifically into Sino foreign joint ventures. Um, and this is drawing off of research from 1985 to 2009, so the last 34 years, we can see uh, this, uh, this trend of uh, pre-peak, post-peak, and um, following the trough. And if we specifically bring that to China, um, and this is going back since the joint ventures were allowed to start being formed, um, you can see the same trend going on. Uh, following a major crisis about a year or two later and, and a year or two because of the uh, formation timelines, uh, you see an, in, an increase in joint ventures. So the green, the green bars are formations of Fortune 500 companies. Um, so that's a 376 companies because there's 124 Chinese companies on it. The orange lines are, are terminations. And I'll unpack a bit about um, the importance or the, the, the strength of the joint venture structure. So if we look at this data, you'll notice that the terminations are significantly fewer than the formations for this group. And actually, it's about an 85% survival rate. Now, I realize that's probably slightly overstating due to some of the issues related to shutting companies down. But if we use other, um, other data from other sources, and the specifically the most recent study that's been identified is a 2008 study from Brazil, uh, it shows very similar, um, very similar outcomes. So the number of um, joint ventures that continue to be joint ventures 10 years out is about 50%, but about 83% of the companies continue to be in operation. So if we are thinking about um, joint venturing and how to approach it, and particularly Sino foreign joint ventures, we, um, we quickly come to the view that uh, these are very resilient, uh, generally successful formations, notwithstanding the reputation that many of these companies have. Um, that said, uh, I never like to start about a uh, discussion only looking at one form of corporate formation. So with, um, with any entry or any sort of setup, you have three or four choices, and, and these are the classic three. Uh, go alone, so, which I, I suspect what most companies have, have already done, acquire and, and joint venture. And there's a set of criteria that you can quickly walk through. I don't propose to go through all of these to establish which one is the right one for your organization. Um, I think when we start talking about M&A and joint venture, there's some very specific variables in terms of um, you know, whether we're trying to deal with the, the negative list to the earlier conversation, that tends to put you towards joint venture. If we're um, unable to find targets, clearly it's in go alone uh, as an example. Um, but there's also two other issues that maybe not fully coming out from this slide. One relates to execution risk. M&A and joint venture come with a, an issue you can spend a, a long period of time and not actually complete a transaction. Um, and the second is materiality. If you're doing small deals or a series of small deals, it, it tends to uh, sometimes cause more trouble or more management distraction than it's, um, than it's worth. The last thing before I go off here, and, and it's not too frequently talked about, but we're also starting to see it's not just Sino foreign uh, companies doing joint ventures in China. We're also seeing foreign foreign um, companies doing joint ventures in China. The, uh, the ability to, to tap into the market, if we go over the last 40 years since China's been opening up, there are many Western companies that are also able to bring the Chinese market um, you know, as part of their existing infrastructure. Um, 
before, I think I'd like to just kind of talk on, you know, where are we in, in the market cycle? And, and this study came out earlier this week, so I've, I've dropped in a couple of slides. Uh, it's a survey of 1,000 U.S. corporate and private equity CFOs. Um, and it's asking them about, you know, if you're going to be pursuing transactions, and, and there's a couple other questions on which mode are you in, what kind of transactions are you likely to pursue? And you'll notice that, um, you know, alternative M&A, so that's partnerships and joint ventures, uh, comes up as number one. So for anyone who's working in, in these corporates in, in China, the tone that's coming from the West seems to be leaning towards uh, joint ventures. There continues also to be, of course, interest in, in M&A and to a lesser degree uh, di divestitures. Uh, if I drill a little further into that research, and, and this sort of surprised me, is a lot of uh, the CFOs that, that responded, um, you know, rather than taking a, a defensive posture as uh, COVID-19 and the economic impacts work through, you see 57% are reporting that they want to take an offensive or forward-leaning, um, aggressive uh, st stance as, they, as it relates to M&A. So we're expecting, if this you know, survey bears, bears out, we're expecting to see a, an increase in interest in, in M&A and, and specifically in joint ventures. So we're seeing a consistency between what executives are telling us and what the historical research uh, would suggest. Um, if I drill this down even one more level, um, for those that have identified with the, with the aggressive or forward-leaning strategy, 76% uh, are leaning towards partnerships and alliances. And, and the same numbers are, are bearing out in the private equity uh, figures. So it, it's, it's an interesting environment, and, and there seems to be a lot going on. Um, if I sort of turn our focus back to China, uh, and this is working off of a number of cases that, that we've been involved in, and we've aggravated the, or aggravated, aggregated um, them up. And you know, so then the question becomes, when you start talking about joint ventures, why do you do it? And so coming across, and my comment about foreign and foreign joint ventures and market access, you'll notice that in almost every case, actually in every case, the Western partner, as they're coming in and looking at the market, um, even if they're already in the market, because it could be a different subsegment, is looking for market access. And in about half the cases, we see the Western partner looking for some sort of asset or cash um, injection uh, as part of the, the transaction. There are other reasons, of course, and they're listed off. If we look at the Chinese partner side of it, um, in every case save one, there's been some element of IP or, or know-how. And obviously, we've defined IP fairly broadly. That could be brand. It could be some very specific technology. Um, but more often than not, it is know-how. So how do you currently do things? Not things that are patented or, or branded, but that process through which um, Western companies are, are currently working. Um, it's taken a long time to develop and, and has value. Equally, uh, market access is also of interest to the Chinese partner. And that, that could be China market, but often it's the international market. So we're seeing this nice blend of you know, easy fits uh, to come together, albeit with certain risks and, and deal issues. So you know, we're seeing a you know, very interesting set of combinations coming together. So if I take that and I start to play that through to um, best practice, um, and this is where I, I go maybe slightly more academic, but it's the same process practitioner-wise as well. The, the process for setting up a joint venture is very well um, established. Typically, there's some sort of a strategic rationale or set of objectives that are trying to be achieved. Then the exercise becomes selecting the partner. Um, and as we'll see in the next couple of slides, partner selection um, from a practitioner point of view and from the research is probably the most important step. Uh, then there's an, you know, an exercise to negotiate, get to know your partner, um, and structure the deal. And then we move into implementation and then ultimately evaluation. You'll notice that we've put the, the looping arrows in here because um, most of this process is straightforward in terms of defining strategy and implementing, but the actual formation process tends to be quite circular. Um, move forward, move back, start, start, stop. Um, and that's one of the reasons why I worry about execution risks in many cases. Um, to help sort of mitigate and accelerate uh, through any, any deal, um, we typically talk about using three very basic questions. Um, and these questions are, are listed on the screen uh, in front of us. Um, but the idea behind these questions is if you can't answer these, you're probably not in a position to be uh, pushing any deal forward, whether in China or um, 
or domestically. Uh, the first question, very simple question, and, and you can start with your own. What are your commercial objectives when, with this planned uh, venture? And equally, what are your counterparty's commercial objectives? Because if there's no alignment, um, you're going to end up having a, a series of issues and an erosion of trust. Second question relates to any red lines. And if you don't know where your red lines are, that tends to be um, a, a problem. But equally, you should be transparent enough that you know where your red lines are and, and the counterparties are. If the red lines are drawn in such a way that you'll never get a deal done, um, at least know that up front and save the, the time and the effort. And then the last question is how, it's a how question. How is each party going to achieve its objectives? Generally speaking, you know how you're going to achieve your objectives. Um, you've defined them and you know how you're going to get them. But you equally need to be thinking about how your, your partner is going to achieve their objectives. Because um, they're going to know how they're achieving them. But if you don't know, that tends to create a problem. Um, and that leads to trust issues. And when we start dealing with um, joint ventures that are in trouble, typically it's relating to either governance or trust. And the two are very closely interrelated. Um, so that's where the analogy of it's, it's a marriage rather than, a, than an acquisition. Um, talking to uh, best practice, uh, this, is, um, this is coming from, from both academic and practitioner experience. But you, the, the exercise of finding a partner, um, you can divide more or less into two, two sides. One, task related, which is typically uh, tick the box type items. Do they have it? Do they not have it? So, you know, can you meet the regulatory requirements? Do you have the IP that I need? Do you have the facilities, the money, the resources, the people, whatever it is um, that are your criteria? And that's fairly easy to check before you get too far into a discussion. On the other side, and, and what's generally viewed and as the more important elements, are the partner-related uh, criteria. And this, it takes time and usually a few dinners and, and some negotiation. But you need to establish, you know, do I trust them? Uh, do we have a sh shared set of values? Do we have a shared uh, vision for the business? Um, th those types of criteria. Uh, and, and they tend to be the more important ones, but are the more difficult to assess. Which then leads us to how to avoid getting into uh, a discussion that can't be uh, completed. And so these eight points that are on the screen in front of us, what we would use as principles. The ones on the top four come very, top row, the top four come very early in the discussion. What's the joint venture going to do? How are we going to define success? Uh, and that can be uh, financial, but more frequently it's also around market share or some other uh, particular definition. The definition of success typically links to your exit provisions. So if the joint venture is failing by the definition set out um, before you formed it, then you're able to, to get out. Um, control tends to be quite a, an important discussion and being clear up front on what you need to control, whether that's intellectual property, whether you need to consolidate, or if there's certain management roles. And then finally, um, what are you bringing to the joint venture? What do you want the other side to bring to the joint venture? Pretty straightforward. On the bottom row, these are the ones that tend to come up later. Um, exclusivity uh, can relate to where the joint venture is or is not allowed to, to trade, so geography, product, um, some other definition. And it also can relate to uh, negotiation exclusivity. So in, in the marriage example, are we, as we're dating, are we allowed to date others or not? Um, compliance uh, tends to be a bit of a, a complicated one that comes up usually in the last three, four weeks of a negotiation process. Um, and I, I won't go too much into that. Uh, governance is, is probably the next super important one. I have a separate slide talking only to governance. And that, with the new law, uh, has changed, and it's one of the, the better changes that comes from the, the change. Before, under the old system, the board of directors was the, the top level, and you had fewer options on how you could deal with governance issues. Under the new law, it looks more, uh, more like a Western governance structure, which is uh, with the shareholders uh, on the top of the structure rather than the board. Um, and so that creates more opportunities to put uh, you know, different levels and, and more nuanced forms of governance. And then the last piece is on the negotiation uh, timeline um, and who needs to do what by when. With a joint venture, if one side is doing all the work, they typically don't complete. So uh, I'm a huge proponent that both sides uh, need to have certain work and, and before you progress too far, the other side needs to have completed what they want. Um, otherwise, they, they're not invested and it's, it's more of a, an option for them rather than an actual negotiation process. Um, 
Now, I've spoken about the, the governance, and I'm not going to go through all this in detail, but I will pick out a couple of points. And, and picking up on the previous speaker's uh, comments that um, with the change in the law, the, the legacy joint venture, so those, all those ones in the Fortune 500 I showed on the earlier slide, and then obviously there's thousands of these joint ventures, they need to migrate to a different uh, governance model, and that's going to be a very sensitive discussion. Uh, over the next four years in, in their ventures or buy their partner out if they don't want to engage too deeply in, in these discussions. Um, so that's, uh, that's one change. But then as you're negotiating new ones, um, this, these levels are, and structures are, are, are now available. So you still in, and historically had the joint venture agreement, which, which is the contract. Um, the shareholder committee, which is you know, the normal shareholder group, um, now has the final highest level of say as opposed to the board of directors. Um, you can put subcommittees of the board. You can have an operating committee. Uh, and that tends to be more European than American, depending who's on the call. And then there's, the, there's an approval matrix. From a, a practical point of view, the, um, the, re, the discussion here is about which joint ventures get into trouble and which ones don't. And, and given the importance of trust and the way that uh, governance inter interacts with trust. The boards, if you're only operating at the board level, those tend to be the joint ventures that get into trouble. Uh, it's the ones where you have people in the management at the operating management committee or you have people who are in the approval matrix flow so that you're not getting information three, six, 12 months later, but you're getting it uh, on a more real-time basis and have an understanding and, and are better able to contribute uh, to the practice or the business. Okay, so this is, um, this is the last slide. I've gone very quickly through this. Um, so this is the last slide, and, and so if there's more, um, more interest in any of the particular topics, by all means, feel free to uh, reach out to me. I'm happy to uh, field any questions or get into much more of the specifics. Um, there's a, a recent white paper that if you go to the Deloitte China website, uh, you're more than welcome to, to download that. I've mentioned the CFO survey. That's on the Deloitte US website. So US website ends .com. The China ends website ends .com .cn. Um, With that, unless you want me to go into lots of questions. All set? All right. Thank you very much. Thanks for Alan's speech. Our last speaker is Yang Wenzheng, the general manager of Rough City The Bond. He will present introduction of Rough City The Bond. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Wenzheng, and I'm the uh, general manager for our project in, uh, in Shanghai, it's our latest project in Hong Kong district. Uh, it's called Raffle City the Band. Um, as you can tell from the name, it's, it's uh, by the band of uh, Shanghai. And, uh, and the Raffle City and uh, Capital Land, I would say, these are the, uh, uh, the, these are the, uh, uh, our, our basically, this, this is, this is uh, um, our branding, right? Uh, so, so Capital Land, uh, we are a developer in, uh, based out of Singapore. Uh, we've been a uh, foreign investor in China. So we ourselves are a foreign investor. We have been in China for over 20 years, and uh, our job is mainly doing uh, real estate development. Uh, uh, we do a lot of commercial buildings. Uh, we do high-end residential. We do uh, offices. We do malls. And uh, the Raffle City branding is, is one of our top branding uh, uh, projects in, in Shanghai and in, in China. So maybe I'll just go through an introduction of our project. Yeah, so... So uh, we are from Singapore, and uh, we are one of Asia's uh, largest uh, diversified real estate groups. Uh, we, we do a lot of uh, um, investment, we do fund management, and we do uh, development work. A, uh, at this point, our, asset, our assets are about 130 million, a billion Singapore dollars, and uh, more than double our assets, I would say, are all in uh, funds, and our, our assets under management are even uh, about uh, more than 300 uh, billion uh, US uh, Singapore dollars uh, at this point. Yeah. So uh, the pictures you see here are some of our projects that we have. The, 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 the one to the top is, uh, is Raffle City Chongqing, 
which is one of our newest projects as well. As you can see, it's a very big project. And uh, the one at the bottom is a, a fairly iconic one in Singapore. It's in Changi Airport, Singapore, where there's the uh, world's largest uh, indoor fountain. Yeah, so we do a lot of commercial projects. Uh, as you can see in this, in this slide, uh, we do residential homes, we do integrated and mixed developments, we do investment management, uh, we do serviced residences, uh, which is the Ascot brand, Somerset brand, that's all under us. We do offices as well, and uh, of course we do shopping malls. So uh, we are focused in Asia, uh, we think uh, that's where our capabilities are, and uh, we are focused on uh, uh, pre premium commercial real estate. So, uh, our, our two largest markets at this point are Singapore and China. Uh, we are also in, uh, in um, Southeast Asia as well, but, uh, and we, are, we have also a pot, uh, some, some properties in uh, Europe and the US. But I would say that uh, at this point, uh, one of the uh, largest markets for us is China. So uh, we are actually the largest foreign real estate developer in China by GFA. Uh, the, obviously, the local, local guys, they are very large. Uh, but for foreign, foreign developers, we are the, essentially the largest uh, right now. So we are in 42 cities in China, uh, but our focus is still on the tier one, tier one cities. Over the last 20 years where we have been in China, we have developed a lot of residential homes. Uh, at this point, we operate and we own 32 shopping malls and uh, 28 commercial developments and offices. Uh, we also have uh, large-scale developments, uh, which we call uh, urban developments. They tend to be... In the, in the several square kilometers to uh, hundreds of square kilometers, you know, where, that, that covers all kinds of uh, developments. Uh, and also we do business parks. We have nine business parks in, uh, in, in China. A lot of them are government to government level uh, collaborations. And then a lot of our assets, as you can tell, they are, they are uh, held for, for, for rent. And therefore, I think we tend to hold these through uh, real estate investment trusts, to REITs, to funds, to PE funds as well, uh, because these are all very asset-heavy, uh, very capital-intensive uh, projects. So, so we, debt, we tend to uh, have to fund it through, through, through various uh, funding platforms. Uh, so we do a lot of funds as well. I think in terms of real estate funds, we are also one of the more successful uh, players in, in China, uh, where we have been able to raise funds and then invest successfully in China. Yeah. So uh, maybe I'll just zoom in to the Raffle City product because out of the so many products that we do, the Raffle City product is the one that is our highest end, uh, a top a high end a commercial pr a project where it is essentially comprising uh, a mixture of, of uh, products all into one. And that's what we call uh, integrated development and we use the Raffle City branding for it. So it tends to have uh, great offices together with a retail mall. I think that's the, that's the general sense. It, uh, from time to time, we also have projects where there's a, a hospitality component. We have an escort as well inside. Uh, and then, uh, yes, uh, sorry, it's hot. Yeah. Uh, so so uh, I, I would say that this, this uh, integrated development um, uh, concept has is, is been very successful for us. Uh, we, we, we focus on premium locations in the city where there is... Uh, at least two metro lines uh, crossing, and then we, we, we find that it's a transport node in the city, in a central location, and we choose, of course, the, the key cities, the large cities, and, uh, and we will then invest in the land and we will build a premium product. So that's the that's Raffle City branding. We started off with the first one in Singapore, which is uh, Raffle City Singapore, right, right in the heart of Singapore at City Hall. And then since then, we've gone on to invest in a few more. We started with Raffle City Shanghai, which was our first... Uh, Raffles City in Shanghai. Uh, we went on to do three, and uh, Raffles City Changning, and then, as you can see, Raffles City the Bun is the one that is opening this year. Yeah, so, so these are our eight Raffles Cities in China. We are very proud of all of them. Uh, all of them have opened uh, progressively, starting from 2005 till now, and uh, by 2020, we'll have eight open right now. So this is Raffles City the Bun. It comprises of two twin towers, uh, the tallest twin towers in uh, the whole of Shanghai. So there's a very tall building. Uh, at the, on, uh, be beneath it, there's a very large retail mall, uh, which is of 130,000 square meters. So uh, it's a big integrated development com com in total. With the retail, with the office, all in all, it's about uh, 400,000 square meters of space. Uh, it is also a transportation hub. 
because it's a uh, dual metro lines and uh, it has a, a whole variety of uh, access to road as well as to uh, uh, this uh, uh, bus terminals. So, so it's it's our our I would say it's something that we are looking forward very much to as we develop over time. It's going to be a premium grade A product developed uh, designed by uh, Pelly, Pelly Clark Pelly from the US. So this is the view from the building. I think this is what uh, all of us got very excited when we, when, we, when we worked on this project. So from this building, you will see this view. Uh, you have the, the Lu Jiazui view of the current financial center in, uh, in uh, Shanghai. You also have the Ban view, which is the historical uh, part of Shanghai. And then, and then, of course, you have the beautiful river view as well. So this is an amazing view. It's the, it's the million dollar uh, view. And uh, I think uh, uh, behind this, of course, you have all the good um, uh, hardware that goes in the building of a grade A building. And then it will make it basically a, a, a wonderful place to work and to live and to, and to, and to play because of our shopping mall as well. So uh, anyone who is uh, working here will have access to all the amenities, including of the large shopping mall. And that's where we think that uh, we are going to be able to provide a very good value proposition to anyone who is our tenant. In, whether you are a tenant in the mall, whether you're a tenant in the, in, the, in the office, I think it's going to be a very good value proposition. Yeah, so, so uh, once again, we, it's one of the great uh, office spaces with a 270 degree uh, view of uh, Shanghai. Uh, very good hardware, 3.2 meters net ceiling height and uh, all the kinds of uh, uh, sustainability uh, things all built into it, including lead gold. Yeah, so this is the lobby, this is a view of the lobby. It's a, it's a, 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 a grade A building uh, that uh, we, we not only have the hardware, but we are also putting the software the software of a developer that is from from an uh, international developer who is used to international methods of uh, of building management, facility management, lease management. Uh, we bring all of that uh, as an international angle. And I think uh, in the past we have always proven very successful when we deal with uh, international uh, brands because they see uh, that there's a common language that they speak with us uh, in terms of lease management, in terms, in terms of property management, and then that's how we are able to provide. Uh, uh, them a comfortable place that they can call home uh, uh, very quickly, in a, especially when they come to a foreign environment. Uh, we have uh, also worked on uh, co-working spaces. We have uh, dedicated the fifth floor to a co-working space, which is run by us. And then uh, it allows uh, anyone coming here uh, with a lot of uh, a, uh, opportunities, essentially, to, to, to tap onto the co-working resources that we have here so that everyone uh, you, bef before, well, as you need time to set up your operations, you can always come to our co-working space. Yeah. Uh, right now, the building is uh, about half leased. Uh, we are, there's a theme here uh, in, in line with Hong Kong districts, uh, uh, a theme of FinTech, uh, financial technology firms. So uh, we, are, we are very much uh, thinking that that is the right uh, uh, positioning for the building as well. And uh, we, uh, f uh, some of the larger uh, fintech firms are all coming to our building. So uh, as you can see here, there's uh, essentially finance, banking, uh, uh, the insurance. That's one of the main focus that we have. Uh, as you can tell, that also that also makes sense for for a grade A building of, of this of this stature. Yeah. So this is where we are. Uh, the shopping mall. Just some pictures. Uh, we have a lot of shopping malls in China, and I think we are fairly experienced at this. So. So what, what we do is uh, a mall that's going to be a great amenity for anyone who's working here. And this mall being this, of this scale and this size, it will also be a, a destination uh, that's, that's going to be across Shanghai. Yeah. So just, this is just more perspectives of our building. Uh, in, well integrated, the office as well as the mall. Uh, finally, I just want to add that uh, this, 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 this project is, uh, is very inspiring to us. Uh, we, we, we see it not as just, just hardware, very good hardware, but it's also uh, in a very central location in Shanghai that is just being redeveloped into a new CBD for Shanghai. There's a lot of history in the area. As you can see some of the historical pictures, uh, it was the Jewish settlement uh, du during, during the war period where there were, there were a lot of refugees coming, coming, coming out of, of uh, Europe. Uh, uh, 
there's a, it was a port in the early days, and there's, uh, there's a, some historical temples and, and history in that time. So, so we are also turning this into a tourist. Uh, 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 we're working with the government on the tourism angle to this as well, including the, the, the two, build, two uh, uh, rooftop gardens that we have. Uh, I think all of it will be combined into something that will not just be a modern building, but it will also have a lot of character and soul because uh, of the history that we intend to, to link and tap and uh, connect into the overall building as well as the mall. Yeah, so just some pictures of the views and the, and the history in the area. Yeah, so that's another view of us. So yeah, is that for you? Oh, thank you. We want to thank our guest speakers and we want to thank you for all listening. We hope you found the webinar informative. Our next webinar would be on December. Please stay tuned. If you have another question, please leave us an email. Thank you all again and I'll see you in December.